I was thinking about cholecystectomies and I was thinking about gallbladder removal surgeries and how many gallbladder removal surgeries happen today. Cause you were talking about back surgeries, you know, shoes and back surgeries that are unneeded probably. Uh, but how many cholecystectomies, how many gallbladder removals happen that don't need to happen today? Because I really think that most gallstones, cholelithiasis is choline deficiency. And again, we're back to the same nutrients that are found in animal foods and animal fats that create healthy teeth. That mean you don't need to use toothpaste with microplastics or fluoride and the same nutrients like choline allow your body to make proper bile. So bile is made from cholesterol, bile salts, um, and a few other components. And if you don't put enough bile salts in the, in the bile, then you get bile stones. So there's an imbalance between the bile salts and the cholesterol. That's generally what, what makes cholesterol stones form in a gallbladder. And those are the most common stones. Well, it's quite interesting that the formation of bile, so the bile for the bile, <clears throat> for the bile acids to collect in the gallbladder, you have to move them from the liver, from the canaliculi, from the hepatocytes into the canaliculi, and they collect in the liver. Um, and then they move to the gallbladder and that process is choline dependent. So if you don't uh, have enough choline, I think that most gallstones are the result of that. So how many people could avoid cholelithiasis by just getting enough animal foods? How many people are choline deficient? Here's another reason that being a vegan or vegetarian is very dangerous in 2022 because, hey, look, you're going to be choline deficient, then you're going to get gallstones, and that's a problem. Then you're going to lose your gallbladder for no reason when you could just have eaten animal foods. Well, I looked it up. It says an estimated 700,000 of these surgeries per year, 700,000. Now, here's the point, too, to take it a step further, and that's an, an amazing education piece on that choline-dominant pathway of the liver making the bile, concentrating it, storing it in the gallbladder. But here's the thing, too. Once the gallbladder is gone, you ain't getting it back, and now when you go to animal-based, meat-based, you're adding all this stuff in, now you're at a disadvantage because now you don't have any storage. Now, you'll still make some bile from the liver, right? But you're missing out on that roughly, what, 10x, I've read, 10x uh, concentration. So... Like it, it, it's a big deal. My mother-in-law, she didn't listen to me for years. I'm like, okay, we need to do this to help your gallbladder. We got to get these foods in, try these enzymes temporarily. You've got tons of gut dysbiosis. Let's work on this. She doesn't listen. Guess what happens? She has a gallbladder attack, goes in the emergency room. Evan, they want me to take out my gallbladder. I'm like, it's just an attack. It's not going to kill you. They did the HIDA scan. There's no like active blockage. It's just a stone. Let's just get you back home. Let's work through this. No, I'm going to go ahead and let him take it out. Now she has massive digestive problems as you and oh. I, I think, I think we discussed this either on your show or maybe last time you came on mine. Now it's the issue of you don't have that antimicrobial because the bile is an incredible antimicrobial. So now the gut dysbiosis goes crazy too, because now you don't have that bile that naturally would have neutralized any pathogens from the food. So now like your stomach is not going to be optimally digesting or breaking down or possibly killing pathogens that you're consuming. So now you've opened up a whole nother can of worms. We need these organs, man. People are taking out their gallbladders like it's nothing. And it's, it's a problem. I mean, the appendix is another interesting rabbit hole. All of the potential lymphoid tissue, these pyres patches throughout the small intestine, but also potentially in this region of the colon <clears throat> that could, uh, that could lead to, you know, immune, uh, immune effects. And then you take out the appendix and were there, you know, is it really vestigial? I don't know. We lose it, but why do we lose the appendix so much? Why do, how many, let's look up how many appendectomies happen a year. So we found that there's 700,000 colon, uh, cholecystectomies. And I'm curious how many appendectomies I thankfully have both my, my, uh, my gallbladder and my appendix, but Me a too. lot of people lose them. Me too. So Google says approximately 280,000 appendix removals per year. Okay. So gallbladders are even more. That's yeah. interesting. But And as you know, in the very similar aspect, this is usually an emergency surgery. So like people just, they're, they're so afraid they have this attack and doctors like you got to do it or it's already ruptured, you know, so that is not in that good. case, you pretty much have to do it. I mean, and, and to be fair, like, let's just be very clear here that that cholecystitis can be life-threatening. Um, the gallbladder can get massively inflamed. Um, cholelithiasis and cholecystitis are different things. Cholecystitis is when the gallbladder is actually inflamed and there's an infection there and bacterial involvement and like appendicitis is the same thing. So I think a lot of appendectomies do have to happen acutely, but the question is how much of both of these could be prevented 
with uh, differences in the diet. And I do wonder how much of our diet has a role in appendicitis. And when I remember being in uh, medical school and it's probably two in the morning, Evan, and we're doing another appendectomy and I'm a medical student and I want a good grade in this rotation. So I have to be chipper and super excited to take out this guy's appendix or at least watch the surgeon take out this guy's appendix while I hold retractors at two in the morning. Uh, And he goes, why did this, you know, why did this happen tonight? Why tonight of all nights, this guy's appendix decide to become inflamed and do all these things. And the the answer you're supposed to give is fecalits. You know, there's just a a piece of poop, a poop rock, (laughs) a fecalith got stuck in there. It's the most unsatisfying explanation ever. You're telling me that randomly this, this human's poop became a rock and got stuck in their appendix. There's something else going on there. Some sort of dysbiosis or something weird, you know, to inflame the aperture of the appendix or something got swollen there because of something immunologic going on, on in the gut. I have no doubt that, uh, that appendicitis is related to diet as well. Oh, well, I had one guy actually who went to the emergency room. He was diagnosed with appendicitis, but they didn't want to remove it for some reason. They said, no, we don't think you're in an immediate danger somehow. So they sent him home despite being diagnosed with appendicitis. So all I did was give him my best educated guess. I thought, okay, well, you 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 look at the you look at the colon, you look at the ileocecal valve. I thought, huh, maybe this is related to gut bacteria. Maybe this is like a dysbiosis situation. So I just dosed him with extremely high dose probiotics, and he recovered very quickly, and he never had an issue again. So I don't know. Like some argue, the appendix is like this storage facility for beneficial microbes, and that if the 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 intestines get too messed up, the Appendix goes, oh, hey, here's some beneficial microbes I've been storing for you. So that's kind of why I came in with the probiotic vein, and it helped them. So I don't know. 